Good morning, First Church family and friends, and welcome to a brand new year. I'm so excited to be able to share in this time of worship at home with you today. My name is David. I'm the pastor here at First Church of Christ. Again, welcome. You know, I hope and pray that you had a blessed Christmas season and that you're looking forward to what God has in store for us as individuals and as a church in 2022. Let me just remind you to go ahead and fill out a digital connection card by clicking on the tab located there at the top of the church online platform or by clicking on the link located in the description of the video if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, it's a big help to us to know who's attending online and, and we thank you in advance for, for doing that. Also feel free to interact during this gathering in the online chat. Uh, you can leave a comment, you can share a, a prayer request, uh, you can even invite your friends to watch this service along with you this morning. In a moment, we're going to jump right into some songs of worship to help usher us into the presence of God. And since you're there at home and maybe nobody else is listening, you can probably just sing out at the top of your lungs if you want. Also remember, as a part of our worship today, we're going to be sharing in a time of communion together. And so if you want to go ahead right now and gather your elements, some crackers, uh, some juice, uh, then you'll be ready to share in that special time of remembrance. Again, I am excited you are here. Let's go ahead right now and jump into a time of praise and worship to Almighty God. Come on, how many know we serve a God who's never lost? No matter the situation, He always wins. Come on, sing this with us. Miracles when you move such an easy thing for you to do And your hand is moving right now You are still showing up At the tomb of every Lazarus And your voice is calling me out And right now I know you're able And my Cause you never lost a battle No, you've never lost a battle And I know, I know You never You can't do 
to all me. I know you can. You can do all me. But then, cause you never lost the battle. No, you never lost the battle.
just want to be with you. Just want to be with you, Jesus. Just want to be where you are. Just want to be with you, Father. Right here, right now, in your presence. It's where I want to be. Right here, in your presence. I don't want to be. songs around here, we always clap. Do you know why we do that? It's like putting an exclamation point on the statement we just made. We just want more of Him. And when we clap together, we're agreeing together that we need more of His presence. So Myron, can we just stay here for just a second? Call out to Him. Call out to Him. Ask Him for more. Ask Him for more.
here's some good news. 2021 is over. We can all kind of breathe a sigh of relief. Maybe. Uh, we can look at, at 2021's problems in the rearview mirror. Maybe. Uh, this year, 2022, is going to be much better. No more disease, no more death, destruction, or political disarray. Well, probably not. But our all-powerful God is still on his throne, definitely. The fact is, we don't know what will come in 2022, which is why, as Christ followers, we trust God with whatever will happen. We remember that Jesus is the Lord of our lives. We remember that our all-powerful and loving Father, our King, is on His throne and everything is ultimately under His control. We remember that as Christians, God's Spirit indwells us, empowers us, and guides us. We remember that as His disciples, as disciples of Jesus, we are sent into the world to share His good news of salvation through Him. We are His ambassadors who share His message of reconciliation that He accomplished on the cross. Each of us has the responsibility as Christ followers to tell others the meaning of this communion meal. You know, one thing that we know for sure, a day will come when there truly will be no more disease, no more death, destruction, or political disarray. It's described in the Bible as a time when Jesus, the Lamb of God, who has taken away our sins, returns. When the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven from God, when God will dwell personally with his people, when, he, when we will be his people and God himself will be with us and be our God. That may happen this year, or maybe not. We don't know when Jesus will return, and so we remember what the Bible tells us, that we must keep watch. We must remain faithful to Jesus to grow closer to him and to his mission. And in the meantime, we gather as a community of God's people to remember what Jesus did on the cross for us. We take bread that represents his body and we eat it. We take the cup that symbolizes his blood shed for us and we drink. And every day we proclaim with John, who wrote the book of Revelation, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.
There is an old story about a happy little boy who went out into the, ball, into the field wearing a baseball cap. Uh, in one hand he carried a baseball, in the other he carried a baseball bat. And his face bore the look of tremendous confidence. Cocking his bat, he tossed the ball into the air and he said, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. And then he swung and missed. Strike one, he said. He picked up the ball again, he examined it, he, he threw it into the air again, and as he swung, he repeated, I'm the greatest batter in the world. Once again, he missed. Strike two, he said. Well, this time he stopped to examine his bat, and, you know, to make sure that there wasn't a hole in it. And then he picked up the ball, he adjusted his cap, he, he tossed the ball into the air, and for the third time he repeated again, I'm the greatest hitter in the world. And he swung with all his might and he missed for the third straight time. Wow, he cried out, what a pitcher! I'm the greatest pitcher in the world. Well, today is both the first day and, or excuse me, the second day and the first Sunday of a new year. And uh, as we look back over these past 12 months, I'm not sure whether or not most of us would, would be considered pitchers or batters. But one thing is for sure, and that's that at times we have all struck out. And so I guess it's good to be able to start over afresh. Uh, this week, most boys and girls are going to have to return to their school classrooms. A lot of young people are going to be heading off to college. Uh, most of us are recovering from the activities of Christmas and New Year's, and, and we're anticipating getting back to our jobs and the activities of the New Year. But what do you anticipate for this year? Are you full of enthusiasm, looking forward to what each day will bring? Or are you filled with a sense of dread, worried that this year may be worse than last year was for you? Uh, like the little boy with that bat, may I suggest that your attitude, your, your frame of mind, your reaction to its events will largely determine whether this year is a year of victory or a year of defeat. The Apostle Paul was never one to let circumstances conquer him. Rather, with the help of God, he was determined to win the victor's crown. Now listen to his attitude, his dedication, uh, let his determination uh, shine through in these words found in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, where Paul writes, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press through, I, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling me or is calling us. And so with Paul's words fresh in our minds, here are some suggestions to maybe help us be all that we can be this year. To begin with, recognize the value of time. Recognize the value of time. How do we value one year? Well, just ask a student who failed a grade. How do we value one month? Well, ask a mother whose baby arrived prematurely. How do we value one week? Editors of a weekly newspaper know that. How do we value one hour? Well, ask someone who lies terminally ill waiting for a loved one who is late. How do we value one minute? Ask someone who's missed a plane or a train or a very important engagement that would never be rescheduled. How do we value one second? Ask an Olympic medalist or someone who just missed having an accident or someone saying goodbye to a loved one that they will never see again. Now, of course, we know that, that time is a human invention. 
You know, I'm convinced that God doesn't wear a wristwatch. God doesn't use a calendar. The Bible says that a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. God deals with eternity, and therefore time is not an important factor with him. But time is an important factor to us because we live in a limited time frame. We begin with infancy, and then we go on to adolescence and adulthood and middle-aged and old age and to everything that follows. We measure life in segments of time. Now, what makes something valuable? Well, oftentimes, it's, it, it, it's scarcity. If there is a scarcity, then that product quickly escalates in value. And so if something is rare, it's usually valuable. But if we have a lot of it, it loses its value. Now, the same is true with time. Uh, maybe that helps explain the, the generation gap that always gets talked about. Young people feel that they have plenty of time. Therefore, time loses its value. And they aren't too concerned about wasting or squandering it. On the other hand, as we get up in years, we begin to realize that our time is becoming rare and therefore more valuable. And so those of us over the age of 60 tend to look at those under the age of 20 and say, don't squander time. It's so valuable. And they reply, eh, no, it's not. We have lots of time, so we can waste it any way we want. And the wider the age gap, the wider the generation gap, because the different values, because of those different values that we place on time. You know, the Bible often speaks of the brevity of life. And it compares life to the weaver's shuttle, just rapidly going back and forth to the shadows of summer that quickly disappear, to grass which grows up, dies, and then is burned. And so it's no wonder the psalmist asked God in Psalm 8, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Statisticians tell us that the average lifespan is now around 76 years. If you're under the age of 30, then you think, that, you, you think that's a long time. But if you're nearing that age, you're beginning to realize that's not really very long at all. I ran across some interesting statistics a few years ago. Uh, someone went to the trouble of, uh, to research what people do with their time, and they came up with uh, these results. For instance, they said, if we live to be 75, most of us will have spent three solid years, 24 hours a day, acquiring an education, you know, grade school, high school, and college. We will have spent uh, seven years, uh, you know, if we, if we, if we live uh, to be 75, we will, we will have spent seven years eating 24 hours a day. Now, some less and some more, obviously. We'll have spent 14 years day and night working. We will have spent five years riding in automobiles or airplanes. We will have spent five years talking with each other again. You know, some more, uh, some less, uh, certainly. Uh, we will have spent one year sick or recovering from sickness. And then get this, we will have spent 24 years of our life sleeping. We'll have spent three years reading books, magazines, newspapers, and the such, and 12 years amusing ourselves by watching TV, uh, going to the movies, fishing, golfing, those type of things. That totals up to 75 years. And, and that's what the researchers say, on the average, most of us will have done with our lives. And as I looked at these statistics, I began thinking, you know, let's suppose that you spent every Sunday of your life for 75 years through, through, uh, through infancy, childhood, adulthood, old age. You spend it in God's house worshiping during the church service every Sunday. Now, if you did that, how much time would you have spent worshiping God? Well, 
figure it out and you find out that the answer is less than five and a half months. Unbelievable. But let's double that because you've always attended Sunday school, let's say. You've never missed Sunday school in all your life. That makes it 11 months worth of time. I mean, just think about that. We spend five years in an automobile, in an automobile and just 11 months in church and Sunday school. 12 years amusing ourselves in front of a TV and just 11 months in, in, in church and Sunday school. And that's if you always attended Sunday school and church and never missed. And I think that tells us a little bit about the brevity of time. And it also tells us something about our priorities in life. You know, the Bible also teaches us that life is uncertain. It's uncertain. You know, time is, is a valuable commodity in, in a very precious and delicate vessel. It might break at any moment, and, and we might lose it all. And so we have this moment. We don't know anything about the future, really, but we have this moment, and that is all we really have. And because of the uncertainty of life, the Bible says, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Hebrews 3.15 says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Because life is uncertain, we must take advantage of the time that we have now. And then secondly, don't be in bondage to the past. You know, we are special beings in that God has given us the ability to remember. Your memory may be your friend or it may be your enemy. When you remember, hopefully you'll remember some of the pleasant things about this past year. But chances are you will also remember some of the negative things of this past year. In fact, sometimes we, we dwell upon the negative, don't we? And we begin to feel sorry for ourselves. You know, maybe this past year was a time of transition in your life. The kids grew up and married and, and they left home and you're now trying to deal with the empty nest syndrome. Maybe your job came to an end and, and you're having a tough time making ends meet. Uh, maybe a loved one died and you're trying to deal with the, the lingering grief and loneliness uh, that you feel. Uh, maybe it was a time when sin got a real hold in your life and, and you now feel the burden and guilt of that sin. You see, those things can cripple us and they can hold us in bondage to the past. That's why Paul said in our passage today, forgetting the past. And Paul had a lot to forget. Paul had a very shaky past. He persecuted the church. He used his authority to kill Christians. And by his own admission, he said, I am the chief of sinners. I mean, he could have walked around all of his life with this tremendous burden of guilt crippling him and he would never have become the great Apostle Paul that we know and love today. Paul said, forgetting the past. In other words, God, I commit it to you. I seek your forgiveness for all the sins of the past, and I look forward to what lies ahead. And right now, I'm going to live today the best I can. And I believe that is good advice for all of us as well. And then finally, I think we need to establish a priority in our lives. Paul says it this way in our passage. He says, I focus on this one thing. I focus on this one thing, he says. Now, Paul obviously did more than just one thing, right? He made tents. Uh, he preached sermons, he established churches, he healed the sick, he wrote books. He, he did a lot of different things. But Paul said, the top priority, the number one priority in my life is to press on, to reach the end of the race, and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. A while back, an expert on the subject of time management was speaking to a group of business students. And after speaking to them for a while, he said, okay, it's time for a quiz. 
And he set a, 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 this one gallon wide mouthed uh, mason jar on the table in front of him. And then he produced about a dozen fist sized rocks and he carefully placed them one at a time inside the jar. And when that jar was filled to the top and no more rocks would fit inside, he asked the class, is the jar full? And everybody in the class said, yep, yep, it's full. Really? He said. Then he reached under the table and he pulled out a, a bucket of gravel. And he dumped some of that gravel into the jar and he shook it, causing the pieces of gravel to work themselves down into the spaces between the big rocks. And then he smiled and he asked the group one more time, is the jar full? Well, by this time, the class was on to him more and they said, you know, probably not, one of them said. Good answer, he replied. And he reached under the table again and he brought out a bucket of sand and he started dumping that sand in and it filled all the spaces between the rocks and the gravel. And once more he asked, is the jar full now? No, the class shouted. And again he said, good. And then he grabbed this pitcher of water and he began to pour the water into the jar until the jar was you know, filled to the brim. And then he looked back at the class and he asked, now what's the point of this illustration? And one eager student, uh, one eager student raised his hand and said, I know, I know. The point is, no matter how full your schedule is, if you try really hard, you can always fit something more into it. <laughs> no, the speaker said, that's not the point at all. The truth, this, the, the truth that, this, that this illustration teaches us is this. If you don't put the big rocks in first, you will never get them in at all. Well, what are the big rocks in your life? I think they should include these. Each day, drawing nearer to God, spending time with Him in prayer, and seeking His guidance for your life through the reading of His, wor His Word. Remember to put these big rocks in first, or you'll never get them in at all. It was Jesus who said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be given to you as well. You know, we've just gone through another Christmas season in which the world was reminded once again that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. In his love, God offered us the most wonderful gift that we could ever receive. An old beggar woman ran out of money. She couldn't pay her rent. She couldn't pay any of her bills. The landlord had threatened to throw her out if she didn't soon pay her rent. The poor woman had only one candle to keep her warm, and on Christmas Day she warmed her hands over that candle. Well, there was a knocking on her door, and she was afraid to answer the door for fear that it was the landlord coming to kick her out. And so she blew out her candle and she sat quietly in the dark and she waited for the intruder to leave. Two weeks later, she found out that the knocking on her door that day was the knock of a friend who had come to bring her enough money to pay her rent and to pay her debts. I wonder how many from time to time have heard the, the gentle knock of the Savior who want so much to come in and free them from the burdens of their sin, but they have ignored his knocking. My friends, this morning God's invitation is offered to any who would accept him and receive him as the Lord of their lives. Yes, he came as a baby in the manger, but he also came as the Redeemer. And this morning, he patiently waits for you. The question is, will you come to him? So little that I am Be consumed with who you are Oh, the glory of your presence what more could i ask for 
so little that I am be consumed with who you are all the glory of your presence what more could I ask for so little Shine upon you and be gracious to you. 